I'm pleased to uh, invite uh, Jim, Dr. Jim McCutcheon from Corpus Christi, Texas. Welcome, Dr. McCutcheon. I'm Jim McCutcheon, and I have been offered the opportunity to be here, and I've appreciated it because I have aortic stenosis, and I have a personal interest in this. Claret Medical told me I might be able to get here, and I said, great. They said they'd pay for my transportation and lodging, and I said, not if it will impair my integrity. And they said, no, the FDA allows that. So that's all they're giving me. Okay. Um, my story starts two years ago when Bob Madry, who has been my longtime cardiologist, told me, Jim, the latest echo shows that you've gone from moderate to severe. It's time for you to look at treatment options. That's all he said. That's all he needed to say. I immediately went home and started looking at treatment options. Obviously, there are three. Do nothing, have open surgery, or have TAVR. So I started looking at the risk-benefit relationship there, and I noted that there is a definite decrease in your life expectancy with aortic stenosis, and it's pretty significant when it's symptomatic, not so significant when it's asymptomatic. I was playing tennis three times a week and feeling fine, so I figured, well, I don't need to worry about this right now, but I'm going to keep on looking. I looked at open surgery, I looked at TAVR, and I didn't like what I saw with TAVR. I didn't like the risk of debilitating stroke and continuing dementia. I looked at dying, and I'm not afraid to die, but I am afraid of disability and dementia. So I kind of was not so sure. I thought, well, with open surgery, it's all washed out. The fragments don't go. I'll go see Sergio Tavares, who did my coronaries 25 years ago. And Sergio said, Jim, you can't have this operation. You're living on your left internal mammary that's plugged into your LAD. It's stuck to the back of the sternum. If I spread the sternum, you're done for. I said, okay, Sergio. So I went home and kept studying. I read the clean tabby. I read the mistral C. And I thought, well, I'll go see what they say in Houston. I went to Houston. They said the same thing. You can't have open surgery. So I had two choices. Well, I'm asymptomatic. So I waited. But about a year ago, I started having pretty severe uh, shortness of breath when playing singles, and I gave up singles. And I read about uh, the Sentinel trial. I had looked at Umbrella and TriGuard and Sentinel, and it looked like Sentinel was probably the best and was going to be available the first. So I emailed Claret Medical, and I said, do you know when that study will be finished? And they said, no. A couple of months later, I emailed them again. Do you know when that study will be finished? No. I was kind of like the kid in the back seat of the car. How much further, Daddy? Are we at the lake yet? Since Claret wouldn't tell me or didn't know, I went to the Cleveland Clinic website, and it said, ask a question. So I put in, I know that one of your principal investigators is there. Can you tell me how long this study is going to take? And in two days, I got a report, and it, the entire report was at least a year and a half. And at the bottom of that was S-A-M-I-R. I didn't know what that was, but I know now, and you do too. So then my symptoms progressed. I got to where my buddies on the tennis court were telling me to quit. They didn't want to see me die. So the study came out. And what I looked at is the risk-benefit relation ratio for me. It looks like the Sentinel has not caused any damage at all. So there's no risk to using the Sentinel. It looks like 99% of the filters come out with debris that would have gone to my brain. That's a definite benefit. All the statistical analysis in the world 
don't mean as much to me as the fact that maybe I'll have a chance to run and play again if I can have a new valve and get my brain protected with Sentinel. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.